And I say again, hello and welcome to the second online pre-event to the National Congress on Civic Education or the Bundeskongress Politische Bildung. And my name is Benedikt Meurer. I'm a consultant uh, at the event department of the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung. And with me today from the Republic of Iceland is, I hope pr I pronounce that correctly, Birgitta Jonsdottir. Welcome, Birgitta, and uh, thank you for being with us today. <laughs> thank you very much. So, Birgitta... Very happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. So, Birgitta, be so, um, before... Um, I would like to ask to introduce yourself and your work, uh, which you can do much more accurate than I could ever do. But before that, I would briefly uh, want to outline our main topic of today. Uh, which could be generally summarized as how does civic participation or sustainable civic participation look like in reality? And uh, Birgitta, you can probably tell us a lot about um, how it works in Iceland and also in Europe as you have been a, a moving spirit of civic participation. And um, secondly, our focus today derives from the basic assumption that democratic behavior and decision making is already learned by children at home, in kindergarten and in school. So we want to have a closer look at uh, teachers and their role in early civic education and how does their work influence civic participation. Um, I mean, I've prepared some questions, but I would really like to ask the audience to post right. questions uh, over the, the live chat. And um, we will pick up as many as possible. We have time for about an hour. And Birgitta, now uh, I want to ask you to introduce yourself and the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I am currently serving as a member of parliament uh, in Iceland. I helped create a political movement in the wake of the financial collapse in Iceland in 2008, uh, which prime focus was uh, democratic reform uh, and um, sort of uh, dealing with the, uh, the imminent financial situation. Um, but the prime, my prime focus has uh, always been about sort of strengthening and changing the fundamentals because the reason why everything collapsed in Iceland was because the fundamentals were not right. Uh, and But I've also worked as a poet and a writer and uh, sort of an internet pioneer in Iceland uh, and, uh, and thus I have worked quite extensively with people that want to use the internet to make the world, uh, the offline world better. And uh, so I, for example, helped um, create, after I got into Parliament, uh, the proposal that has become known as the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, IMI, uh, which aims to make Iceland um, have a unique position in the world when it comes to uh, le legislation in regard to freedom of information, expression, and speech. Uh, within the framework we live in today where information uh, and expression really doesn't have any borders. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's all I can remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. I would start off uh, with the first question. Um, how would you describe civic participation in your own words or what does it mean for you? Uh, well, it means everything in relation to being a part of society. And one of the things that I have learned, and particularly after I got into Parliament, is that our representative uh, democracies are not functioning anymore. And it sometimes feels, the more I look around me and the more uh, MPs I meet from around the world, that we live in sort of democracies which are more like dictatorship with many heads, because it's so hard for the general public to have any influence on the decision makers that they have chosen to represent them. Um, and thus, um, I've started to look at solutions, uh, and I think that for me, it's extremely important to inspire everybody 
every single individual on this planet to participate in their own societies to co-create this uh, dream we have of what sort of reality we want to live in and uh, one way of doing that is to um, have more direct democracy interwoven with the representative uh, democracy and because we uh, are creatures of instant gratification uh, it's important that people feel it's worth the effort to participate in direct democracy and uh, we have done some experiments here in Iceland in this regard uh, the good thing about when you have a good big crisis uh, it also opens up for a lot of uh, uh, changes uh, radical changes in the way people see themselves in their own society and so the city of Reykjavik which is our capital uh, started a project called the Better Reykjavik which is a website where pe anybody that's connected to Facebook um, can post suggestions for change in the city for improvement uh, or a new better bank or whatever come they feel is important and the five top suggestions every month uh, there it's an obligation for the council of the city to process it uh, they don't always uh, process it fully but they uh, process it they don't sort of th sometimes they don't have money for it but at least they process it and discuss it uh, and in some cases already we've had some really great ideas uh, uh, one is my favorite uh, it might not be very big but it was one of the first and it was submitted by a, an eight-year-old girl uh, suggesting that there would be more field trips in the schools in the city and it was actually um, processed and uh, has now been put into full implementation so that, that it's so important that because people are not used to they're used to sort of asking others to look after their communities and it just simply doesn't work anymore because we've become too big and thus we need to figure out ways to make downsize the systems and make people feel that they have a role in their societies. All right, you were talking about the financial crisis in Iceland. I want to pick up the question which uh, is coming over the chat. So how has the financial crisis influenced the relationship between citizens and the state? Has it improved or deteriorated? Deteriorated. Um, how about populist reactions vis-à-vis uh, -vis globalization? Uh, it's both improved, uh, and in some cases, you also have populists uh, sort of overtaking uh, the desperation and trying to use it because, of course people felt that uh, not only did the financial system collapse, I mean we had the thir world third largest financial crisis in the world, in the history of the world, uh, and that means that something more felt than just the financial sector, and people felt that, felt that everything felt them, you know, the academia, the media, the regulatory body, the government, uh, and just about everything. So. Uh, we had a great opportunity to sort of look at inwardly at us as a nation and through the um, um, sort of co-sharing of the creation of a new constitution uh, I think we have a great opportunity to understand uh, collectively in what sort of society we want to live in um, but uh, like I said when you are in shock and when you have a, a big crisis like we had uh, you have either a big window for improvement in society or more repression like uh, in the United States after 9-11 somebody had already prepared the Patriot Act and, and look what that, uh, where that has put the United States when it comes to sort of, uh, uh, civil liberties uh, so I think that we've actually done quite good uh, in retrospect even if it is easy to look at the faults and the difficulties and particularly for those that are suffering financially I think there are many improvements uh, and many opportunities to carry on on this path um, and I'm certainly going to do everything I can while I'm in office uh, I don't know if I'm going to run again it's just not the most desirable job you can get um, 
and but I, I feel that I want to put as much effort as a human being as an individual into help improving my society all right I, I think can we can proceed place. with the next question which comes over uh, the chat from Boke um, how is the stage of the of the constitution process in Iceland at the moment. Uh, you are frozen. But I, I see a question here by Oak. How is the state of the constitutional process? Maybe I should. I'm frozen. That. Yeah. Well, you're not frozen anymore. Yes. <laughs> but you were. Yes. So, do you want to me to answer that? Ah. Uh, okay. I'm Yes, please. Uh, okay. Um, I'm just going to explain a little bit how the constitutional process has been from the beginning because it is sort of fa fascinating. Uh, I have traveled uh, quite extensively in the last couple of years and I always ask people, have you read the constitution? Uh, and I, I want to ask the people watching this if they have. Uh, and I want them to think about why they haven't uh, and I want them to think about the you know what is a constitution what does it mean for me a constitution means uh, sort of it's this social agreement within a society within a nation what sort of nation they want to be and that is why I've been quite proud and passionate by the process uh, in particular when it comes to the participation of uh, the nation. So after the, we've actually had like a, an old copy of the Danish constitution that the king gave us when we got our independence in 1944, uh, and it really doesn't fit within the Icelandic character. The politicians have tried since 45 to draft a new constitution. The other one was just the transi transitional constitution. Uh, so it was obvious to us, the nation, that uh, politicians just couldn't do it because they made our social agreement into some party politics. So the first task with the new government was to call um, a national assembly of 1,000 people. Uh, they were randomly selected from our national registry uh, to come and discuss over a weekend um, in a sort of a world cafe scenario uh, what they felt was important to, to have in the constitution. Uh, and the results of that were gathered um, and uh, to my great delight because sometimes I felt you know like many Icelanders a bit embarrassed about this financial insanity uh, that overtook a large sector in Iceland prior to the uh, financial collapse uh, the, the key words was uh, integrity equality uh, and transparency uh, if, I, if I remember correctly uh, or somewhere along these lines. So these were the elements that people wanted uh, to be a part of our constitution and the way they wanted us to be as a nation. Um, and then of course they went deeply into you know, issues of ownership of the fish and, and so forth and, and how um, the role of the president should be and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and I can send you a link to the English version of the new constitution if you want to. I'm very pleased to say that in it uh, we have the word happiness uh, of the nation, which is quite important. Anyway, so after that uh, yeah, we established uh, an, sort of an election for a constitutional parliament. Uh, and so many people wanted to run that nobody was really prepared for it. <laughs> Uh, I think everybody sort of expected maximum 100 people to run, but in the end it was like more than 500 people running. Uh, and um, so there were slight problems with that, introducing each of these individuals and so forth. It was a bit of a chaos. Uh, there were some setbacks, there are powers in my society, uh, like the, the right-wing people, they believe from the independence party, believe that the politicians should do this. So every trick in the book has been applied to try to destroy this process. 
uh, and one of the trips was to uh, uh, take to court the process of the elections uh, and the court actually ruled in an unprecedented ruling that the elections was uh, void because uh, the votes were not high enough but it still didn't change the outcome so the constitutional parliament was void uh, so the parliament had to because there was no doubt about the people that were elected we had to um, put together a cons constitutional council with the same people they delivered our constitution uh, uh, half a year ago and uh, the parliament has uh, had the task of putting it into national referendum now the sad thing is that the independence party the right wing party in the parliament stopped uh, the national referendum on it if, if the nation wanted this or not um, as being a part of uh, a presidential elections uh, which are going to be happening in june uh, so we are trying to be creative about how we can um, still have it as a part of the presidential elections or you know later in the year um, but we're sort of running out of time because there are going to be new uh, parliamentary elections next year and uh, in order for the constitution to be valid we have to because of the, the current one uh, we have to have one elections between so um, but I'm hoping I'm crossing my fingers that we can actually uh, uh, make the process uh, complete during these four years of this parliament but there was one beautiful element about it when they were going through all the the constitutional council when they were going through the work there were 25 people in it uh, what they did is that they opened for suggestions uh, on a website where people could hook in through facebook uh, or via email uh, and send suggestions or corrections or uh, amendments um, to the, uh, their ideas or their suggestions, the, the councils. Uh, so it sort of opened up uh, a possibility for people to have direct involvement uh, on an individual basis, which I think is very important. And now I've heard that there are some people that really uh, are eager to get people to discuss it, uh, the constitution. Uh, they are actually getting musicians, known musicians, to uh, make songs to parts of the new constitution. So um, there is always well, there is a lot of creativity around this new constitution. So all the suggestions go into this uh, this whole process and and are included into into the constitution or how do I have to well, um, uh, visualize that? Well, sort of, you know, the constitutional council used some of these ideas, not all of them, because uh, uh, they had to come into agreement what they felt that sort of fitted in within like, like um, the spirit of it and the mm -hmm. sort of the, the information they had from the 1000 people's meeting and from the work that was previously done in the parliament. Uh, but they certainly were ready to come and meet people and I know that there were uh, some of the suggestions through the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative uh, of um, net neutrality and uh, freedom of information were included in the new constitution. So uh, it's sort of, um, I don't know exactly, I don't think there was any report on exactly how much they took in and how much they didn't, but uh, at least you had the opportunity to uh, make your voice heard. So it was not an isolated process like it usually is with the constitution making. Okay. Before I pose the ne next question, I really want to ask the audience again to to pose question via the chat, and we will pick them up uh, during the process here. So for me, the next question would be: um, How has um, civic participation changed the work of the government? Um, 
and how or right, how should it be changed uh, in, in your opinion that are important to discuss in this field one is uh, most people think that parliaments are the legislators but we are only sort of considered to be the processing machines for the ministers uh, and the ministries at least in Iceland and uh, you don't usually there is not a lot of transparency in relation to who writes what bit of the law when we get to process them as the uh, stamping machines like some parliamentarians call it so uh, i think it's very important uh, for one is that uh, we know exactly who writes what part of the laws in the ministries because often it's uh, lobbyists uh, and uh, we the parliamentarians might want to scrutinize it further or the general public the general public should have access to the lawmaking in the early incubus status um, and to, to bring forward uh, suggestions already on that stage before we get into the parliament. Uh, I think in relation to how to make people, uh, like in Iceland, it's uh, a part of the way we work, is that when you have a law or a, a, a parliamentary uh, proposal uh, in process in a committee, uh, within the time frame of three weeks, anybody can send in uh, suggestions or their opinions or uh, views or uh, further information for the parliamentarians to, to look at uh, or the you know and once they've done that the parliamentarians often ask them to come to the committee and, and discuss it further now most people are not aware of it and it is very hard to follow it on the website so one of my tasks uh, current tasks is uh, and that's actually something I should be doing right now uh, is to um, bring forward suggestions how we can make the parliament uh, more dynamic with the general public uh, the parliament's website and i can see that we can have sort of a similar process and similar programming as on the website for better Reykjavik uh, and the people behind better Reykjavik that programmed it they originally created something called better iceland uh, and um, I have met with them a few times uh, in relation to how can we apply this to the parliament. Um, and so we're in sort of the process of trying to figure out how to do that. And I think it's uh, important um, that sort of people are aware of uh, what laws and how they are processed uh, and that it should be written in more sort of normal language as well, at least some translations so people understand what it is. Um, because I don't think it's normal that parliaments are full of lawyers. It should be truly representative, um, and it should not be also full of uh, professional politicians. Because very small percentage of each nation is professional politicians. Um, so I think that um, uh, if we can make people give us more sort of uh, feeling that they are following what we're doing. Because right now I feel that people are not doing it enough. I, I would really like people to be more aware of what we're doing in the parliament, in particularly those that are supposed to be giving um, some uh, resistance if the government is going offline or you know off the track uh, from what they promised. Um, so that's one way. Um, and I think like there's one beautiful element in the new constitution. Uh, and it says that 10% of the nation can put together a bill to be processed in the parliament. And I would like to see much more of that uh, and somehow incorporated uh, in the next few years into the sort of the parliamentary process. Uh, and if uh, a certain amount mm -hmm. of people can, uh, um, uh, are, let's say, you know, 5 or 10% of the nation wants to do something like have a national referendum. Uh, or um, to change laws that they should have that ability uh, because it does take a lot of effort to get that uh, large percentage of the nation to be involved and interested Okay, I want, would like to come back to, to one of the questions uh, from the audience um, because your microphone wa wasn't 
working properly or there's some bits missing in between. Um, there was a bad question, how many citizens did participate so far uh, well, there online and offline, uh, what you were talking about before? The General Assembly, uh, 1,000 uh, to the General Assembly. Do you have any numbers? Uh, I, I don't think it's the microphone, I think it's the connection that's breaking up. Um, 1,000 people randomly selected for the uh, the assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, uh, and I don't have uh, numbers for how many people participated uh, oh, in okay. the constitutional uh, council process. But it's quite possible you can find that online on their website. Okay, I see a question here. Um, uh, the Parliament. Okay. So there's a next question. Uh, what role are the media playing in facilitating? Uh, the media is not. Yeah. I think they're not playing enough role. Uh, but the good thing is that there are uh, people out there that really care and are true. Yes. I yeah, wanted to ask you to pick up the next question. Uh, the, the connection is uh, quite bad because you always come in quite late. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to answer this now. Uh, <laughs> the media is not doing enough, uh, but the parliament has a TV channel uh, that's always live when the parliament is in session. Uh, and uh, we have also started a new process uh, in the committees because most of the important work happens I inside the committees in the parliament uh, and there is much more uh, collaboration between all the different parties in the committees it's uh, very different than when people go into the, sort of the making statements in, in the parliament chamber uh, so one of the new things we started is uh, that uh, we have both open meetings uh, for the media and so forth and then we have in the committees and then we have it used to be all closed um, and then we have um, uh, live meetings as well in the committees which never happened uh, prior to this um, uh, new parliament from 2009 But, but I have to say the, the uh, parliamentary TV channel, uh, it's rather depressing. It's so much arguments. Okay. Well, it's... Um, it's just so much uh, used uh, why, to why is that? get the political statement across and, and to uh, sort of be argumentative and uh, I don't know, it's just uh, very boring uh, and people find it to be very depressing um, and uh, very often informative. Uh, so I, I would highly suggest that people rather watch the um, uh, the committees and follow what's happening in the committees uh, and then they might get enough information to be able to um, understand the debates in the parliament but the debates we don't have uh, a good debate culture I have to say I think I've already, yeah, I, I think I've already. Okay, uh, there's the next question. Sort of answered this. Um, just want so to pick that up. Do you want me to answer it again? Or. Well, one of the things that I. So I give a slightly different answer, so I'm not repeating myself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe just briefly. Yes, uh, um, for so, uh, Hoffman, Hoffman, I have already answered you, yeah. this question, but I will answer it in a, a slightly different way, and then you can maybe watch this uh, recording later. 
Um, one of the things my political movement has done because we really wanted to sort of open the windows of the parliament for the public. We wanted to create a bridge between ordinary citizens and the parliament. Uh, and so one of the first yeah, things I true. did, for example, was uh, I had a diary of a parliamentarian that I wrote for one of the newspapers uh, explaining how things are on the inside. Now, I have to say it wasn't very popular with uh, sort of the establishment in the parliament that I was discussing so openly what was going on in there. Um, but I felt it was sort of important that we would take away the sort of halo of secrecy that was around the way the parliament worked. And, and we've made that uh, a commitment to always try to uh, just make it understood for people what the parliament, how it works, really. So that the only way for, and I actually deliberately went in there to understand how it works because I've been so working for so long on the outside as an activist um, and a, a member of various grassroots movements to get access to, uh, you know, parliamentarians or, or ministers and so forth. And so I've been gathering information on how people can participate in it. Uh, and I found that, um, like I said earlier, that through the work, this window, three weeks window that uh, the general public has to uh, when something is in process in the committees, uh, be it the bills or the uh, uh, resolutions and proposals, um, then anybody can actually let their voice be heard by uh, writing to the committee something about the bill. Um, and um, most people were not aware of this, for example. And then, of course, it's this uh, this process and this project of um, uh, Better Iceland, where we actually uh, hook into a website that, uh, for example, would do an RSS if you would want to follow a particular committee uh, and, and sort of get direct information from that particular committee that you might be interested in. Let's say, you know, I, I used to be very interested in anything happening in the environmental committee, but I didn't really want to follow everything else in the parliament. And that's where you sort of get the liquid the democracy ideas that I know that have been discussed, uh, for example, in Germany with uh, the German pirates. Uh, and many people don't understand that concept, but I think it's really brilliant uh, if you want to try to... Uh, uh, hang on a second. Uh, if you want to try, try to uh, get people more involved, yeah. it's of course impossible for an individual to follow everything. So, uh, in the transition from uh, so representative democracies to more direct democracies, I think it's important that we understand how we can integrate these two things together. Uh, and one way is, of course, you follow the things that you're really, truly interested in, and then you, liquid democracy is about, let's say, I know somebody uh, that I trust for environmental issues. So I would trust that person to... Uh, um, I'm so sorry, I'm just going to... Uh, yeah, so then, then I would trust that person to uh, look after my interests when voting for environmental issues. Uh, and I would be following issues of, let's say, freedom of information. And, and other people would trust me to look, you know, they, they would find people they, that they could trust to um, follow different subjects based on their expertise and passions. Uh, and I think that's, uh, it would be interesting to see liquid democracy in uh, real function. Um, so, but I think that the, in general, um, I don't really care how people do it. It is just so essential that people understand that they as an individual have to spend some time at least every week in uh, participating in their democracy in their societies because uh, the times where we trust um, others to look after us uh, this sort of the, the father figure that's usually within the government uh, uh, that's finished we have to learn to be strong together we have to learn that there is nobody coming to save us except mm. ourselves uh, and we have to downsize uh, all the systems um, and because 
there are so many of us now and uh, you know the cities are growing and everything and how can we make it smaller so people feel that their voice is important and then we can uh, get the many in different neighborhoods to speak in one voice um, by gathering their voices in one place because now it's all disconnected so how can we connect it's really about that uh, and we can do that both online and offline um, so I'm sort of hoping that during these times of the hard times that are, looks like are coming in more countries in Europe that uh, we can uh, reevaluate, reevaluate what is important to us you know um, and uh, be more of communities Yeah, I, I would like to pick up that now and um, go to our second part of the, the web talk. So when you're talking about communities, um, teacher play an important role in that as well uh, by educating um, children uh, in school or even in kindergarten. Because of course, and uh, um, so what role do they play the teachers, uh, in the uh, really participatory the process? Uh, in many ways for children. Uh, and so um, somebody suggested to me, uh, I think it was somebody studying political science about how can we make people, sort of students, more interested in this Battle Reykjavik project. And he suggested that uh, it would be a part of their um, education to use the website and, and you know, write essays about their experience on it uh, and do uh, sort of use that as a part of their education. Uh, to be active citizens. Uh, when you have younger children, I think I think it's very important that, for example, we have discussions about you know their responsibilities uh, as individuals in society, and that we teach them more sort of skills that are useful in the day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I, for example, never learned how to do tax return at school, which would have been really handy later on, uh, and uh, I never, when I was. Uh, a child I never learned or read my constitution and most you know I had to be honest most Icelanders never read the current constitution until the financial collapse uh, so in order for us to improve our constitution or at least to know uh, if our politicians are honoring our constitution uh, we have to at least know its content uh, and I don't know if um, uh, you know how it's in your country, but uh, um, it would be really cool if there could be sort of just projects where you teach children the value of, um, for example, participating, like this young girl, the eight-year-old, that uh, put forward with the help of an adult an idea to have more field trips in the school. Um, you know, so she had an immediate sort of consequences of her. Uh, wishes. Sometimes you don't get what you want, but she had to sort of rally for support by uh, giving a good argument. Um, so I think, I mean, teachers are extremely creative. I am sure that if they want to work within this framework, that they come up with what's really perfect uh, for the different age groups and um, um, uh, different uh, subjects in the education. Um, before I pick up the question from uh, Boke, I would like to ask a follow follow question. Um, do you have any projects from Iceland uh, like of this, where um, um, well, of course, uh, um, students or, or pupils we work together I'm with sure, uh, with to teachers, honest, like on uh, a, um, a participatory project? Uh, early on experiments uh, in Iceland because we are rather sort of scattered over this tiny island and we're not that many. Uh, I'm sorry, there's somebody from a private number always trying to call me. I'm just going to answer really quickly and ask them to call later. Can you please call later and uh, leave your number? Thank you. Uh, 
and um, so they, yeah, yeah, I yeah, know. Uh, so yeah. Um, there were some exper early on experimentations with ah, that's live uh, streaming. So sort of distance learning and so forth. Uh, but I don't think that there are any that anybody I might be wrong uh, but I don't think there's been any specific project created yet where teachers teach uh, their pupils um, direct democracy uh, but the project the Better Reykjavik project uh, uh, and Better Iceland uh, they're in English so you can go to citizens.is uh, and have a look at it uh, and even try it because there is a skin uh, on it uh, with uh, Google Translation, so you can get like uh, English version. I don't, I, I'm not sure if it's in German too, but uh, I encourage you to just look at it. And I know that there are very many people out there in, in different sectors, for example, in Germany, they're doing experimentations. Uh, and I think that, you know, I'm sure we can all learn a lot from each other. And we're just sort of uh, at this sort of beginning of a quite important journey. Um, and um, so the more we learn from each other, I think we're going to get better results. Okay, now I think we can pick up the question from Boke. Um, you want to establish a global haven for investiga uh, investig investigative journalism mm -hmm. and transparency. Sure do you I'm think that people are ready to uh, cope with but, uh, to cope with it, or do they uh, have to, to develop certain for, skills uh, to do so? Uh, which uh, role can teachers play in this context? Uh, the reason why we want to establish a safe haven for freedom of information is because of course journalists are under increased attacks in, in particularly investigative journalists but it's also about privacy issues um, you know there are certain countries for example like in the United States people are sort of under attack when it comes to privacy issues and then people in Europe the journalists in Europe are under increased difficulties in getting access to information because there are so many out-of-court settlements before a story is published uh, and thus you might never see the really uh, marrow of the story uh, so when it comes to like uh, privacy issues which I think is extremely important when we're talking about that we are going to be spending more and more time online uh, participating and so forth uh, and putting a lot of uh, or nearly all our life online then we have to make sure that this sacred part of us that's online is honored like the part of us that's offline and that's not the case in the United States so the government there can actually access without your knowledge all your private backend information all your messages or your uh, search story and so forth without you knowing um, because most of the companies that have the social media uh, functions like Google Facebook Twitter and all the others uh, have their stuff hosted in the United States um, so we want to also create the framework so that there are alternatives for these companies that are sick and tired of jeopardizing their revenues and their trust from the people using their services uh, because they can't really uh, look after their backs um, so I think uh, these elements are extremely important to uh, to have hand in hand because um, uh, we want to encourage people to be online but at the same time we have to make sure that their personal content uh, is safe and not to be sort of uh, meddled with. I just got, just before I came on this panel, I got finally answer to a written request I made to the Interior Ministry about uh, there is this uh, when the police puts together a file on everybody that is um, uh, ever sort of any inquiries about. So it could be a witness, it could be somebody that drives too fast, be a criminal and so forth. 
and I just got the numbers and it's quite shocking there are 325,000 Icelanders on it and we are only 310 now so it's sort of like Stasi um, and uh, it's, it was probably not as extensive but it, it's uh, uh, most people are just not aware of like with computers with databases and everything it is so easy to manipulate abuse uh, this information so there needs to be a very big debate about you know how do we preserve our privacy online and um, but uh, when it comes to investigative journalism and uh, transparency and freedom of information I really think we are ready for that in Iceland we really understood that because we didn't have access to information uh, we got into a really deep trouble you know that's one of the reasons we got into this uh, status that uh, that allowed the country to go into such recession Of course, I mean, I think most people in Europe, like we did, think that they have it. <laughs> uh, they think that they have access to the information. They they are not aware of that a lot of the information that they should have access to. Do you also think that the rest of Europe is uh, ready uh, for this process, is, uh, or just know, Iceland? It's it's not a big issue for anybody, I think, and and uh, and certainly nothing to be afraid of to have access to you know, the information that should anyway be in the public domain. Okay, so before I want to ask the, last, uh, the next question, I really want to ask everybody to um, post their questions as well. So um, we're going to pick up three more questions and then we're probably already going to close uh, this um, web talk. Well, um, um, so the next I question is from Joran Musmerholz. Uh, uh, participation participation can be hard work, can be exhausting, uh, be can be frustrating. Would you agree? Uh, and yet, like how uh, can we motivate young people, or should we? I think if people feel that it's you know too boring or you know they can't be bothered. I mean, obviously, if you're going to try to get sort of teenagers to participate, uh, you know, I, I remember teenage years uh, that I was very, very preoccupied also just with my own reality. I didn't really, I didn't really care about all the other stuff. Well, it's not entirely true, but you know, I, I was very preoccupied though with myself and uh, so how can we make them feel that it's worth the while? I mean, um, we can do that by creating a platform like, you know, Aspekte Reykjavik, where, you know, a group of, you know, teenagers can push forward an idea to lobby for that's something important for them in their society. Um, and uh, you know for me for example teenagers are, are some of the most creative uh, innovative uh, uh, people you can find on the planet because they think outside the box and so we have to allow them to think outside the box and to nurture it and, and encourage it uh, even if we might think we are wiser and older um, and the same with children I mean they're so creative and they always see things from a, a new perspective uh, and and e even I remember when, um, uh, for example, if I just take an example from my, my own older son, uh, we had a long discussion about the Iraqi war prior to it uh, started. I actually participated in organizing protests. And, and one day he decided to organize protests, you know, with kids from his school to go to the U.S. Embassy. Uh, only a few came, but still, you know, he did it, and you know, he had some unpleasant experience with the police. They're always a bit rude to kids, uh, and but he had this experience that you know that he went out and did something because he felt impelled to do it. So 
we should always um, uh, nurture these sort of sh because young people have very strong sense of you know justice so how can we nurture that and make that sort of a part of this sort of near society we live in and how can we inspire them to want to be uh, responsible individuals I think it's really easy I uh, just have to make it uh, worth the while uh, and that's why I think it's important we get instant gratification by it, that we see that it works uh, and I'm sure that uh, if it works here it can work anywhere Okay, if there aren't any more questions, I have the last one or the um, second last one. Yeah. So Maybe do you have like any um, examples how uh, civic participation in Iceland or which ex so example of civic participation has had the most sustainable the effect on the participation uh, in, in Iceland? In order to impact the decision that we feel the government is taking that is not in the spirit of what we want, this nation. Uh, and so they figured out that they, like in Iceland, the law is like this. Uh, in order for a law to pass, the president has the final say, or he usually just signs up all the laws. But he has the power to not do it if there is a gap between the nation and the parliament. So people directed a petition to the president to put the ISAF dispute into national referendum. And the ISAF dispute to the people in Iceland was about should we uh, socialize private debt or not and um, the nation actually took two contracts the parliament always went sort of against what the nation wanted uh, and so they pushed for national referendum twice on this uh, same issue um, and um, for me that was uh, an incredible uh, display of uh, direct democracy where you figure out, you know, where can you hack into the system? Uh, you know, how, how can you make the system work for you? Uh, and it's different in all countries, you know, how, who has the power, the final word and so forth. So that was actually quite powerful. I didn't really mind about what the referendum was about, but the fact that I as an individual could make a decision about where, uh, you know, a big issue like that um, with my, fellow Icelanders. Right. Well, you know, I have um, always been uh, a political poet. In the sense that I have right, I see there are no more questions from the audience, so my last question would be how uh, does uh, politics Roses and poetry and fit together? The, I mean, and I was just curious when I read your, your Vita. <laughs> uh, and um, I have tried to use the pen as a way to change the way things, people see things and to inspire them. And I think I'm trying to do the same in, in, in Parliament. I am just simply using this position to bring more power to the people and um, I think it sort of fits, fits somehow. I haven't been ri writing a lot but I still do read and perform my poetry often as a part of my uh, speeches. <laughs> Oh, I lost your last. Uh, can you repeat it, please? <laughs> no, no. Can you repeat it? I, I see. So there is not much time when you're in Parliament to, to write any poems or...
No, no. I mean, especially if you take your job seriously. And in Iceland, we don't have any assistants, uh, so uh, you just have to do everything. Yep, last question. <laughs> so, but um, uh, I will have some time later. No, I just I'll ask if, if there is not much time. Plus, I always recycle my poems. <laughs> No, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, well, so, I mean, then we I want to thank you for uh, this web talk, Germany, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, yeah, I just can uh, refer to Jöran, who says thank you very much for sharing uh, with us, and, uh, and I, I hope the, the process um, is going well uh, further on in, in Iceland, and, uh, and uh, we'll swap over uh, to whole Europe, I think. Hopefully we will in the next few years uh, see much more uh, participation by the uh, teachers, students, and grandparents and mothers and fathers uh, in our societies because it will certainly make our world much better. Yeah, uh, they're all online. Uh, I can send you a link. All right. Well, thank you very much. Ciao. Well, thank you for your time. And I just can uh, refer to the 